This lecture is part of a series of lectures on modular forms and will be about the Peterson um, inner product. So this is an inner product on modular forms. So um, we recall in the previous lecture if f is an eigenfunction of the Hecker operators um, Tn, then this implies lots of interesting conditions. Um, in particular, we get relations between the coefficients. Um, for instance, the coefficients are multiplicative and so on. And if the space of eigen, if the space of forms of weight k is one dimensional, then it's obviously spanned by an eigen function of the Hecker operators Tn. So now we ask what if the space of forms has dimension greater than one, which it usually does. And what we want to show is that in this case it, it's spanned um, by eigenfunctions of, of the operators Tn. Now in order to prove this, and what we do is we recall the result from linear algebra which says that if the Tn commute and their self adjoint, then this implies that the vector space V they act on has a basis of eigenfunctions or eigenforms. So what we want to do is to show that all the Hecker operators commute with each other and they're self-adjoint. Well, self-adjoint means we need to put some sort of sesquilinear form on the space of modular forms, otherwise self-adjointness doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, so um, we've pretty much shown that they commute, so the, the, the T and all commute. So to show this, we first of all observe that Tm times Tn is equal to Tmn whenever m and n are co-prime. And of course this is equal to Tn, Tm. So, so they commute as long as m and n are co-prime. Um, what if m and n are not co-prime? Well, we also more or less showed that Tp times Tp to the n is equal to Tp to the n plus 1 plus p to the 2k minus 1 tp to the n minus 1. And what this implies is that the algebra of operators spanned by tp, tp squared, tp cubed and so on is just generated by the operator tp. And these two things together imply that all the tn commute with each other because um, all the tp for p prime commute by part one and by part two we can write all Hecker operate that the algebra of Hecker operators is generated by the algebra of Hecker operators tp for p prime. So the Hecker algebra of all Hecker operators is indeed abelian and we don't need to worry about that. So now we want to show that they are self-adjoint. Well, the main problem here is what is the inner product that they're self-adjoint with respect to? Um, so um, we, we recall that on the upper half plane there is, there is a, a measure dx dy over um, y squared on h and this is invariant under SL2 of R. So it's a natural thing to integrate with respect. Um, so if F and G are modular functions then it's quite natural to define the inner product of F and G to be the integral over F times G um, dx dy over y squared where this is in integrated over a fundamental domain of, um, of SL2z. So this is for modular functions that are invariant and since they're modular functions it doesn't matter which fundamental domain you choose so this integral makes sense. 
um, so this is going to be a bilinear map. However, there's a bit of a problem that this appears to diverge wildly. Um, so, for example, if f is, say, the j function, it will typically have um, f times g will sit, typically have a term q to the minus n for some n, and q is equal to e to the 2 pi i tau. So the absolute value of q to the minus n is going to be e to the 2 pi n y, which is huge um, as y becomes bigger. In other words, um, this integral doesn't seem to make sense. Um, although we won't use it much, there is actually a way of regularizing it. Um, so what we do is as follows. We look at the fundamental domain, which you remember um, looks like this. So it's this, it's this region here. We're trying to integrate over it. And what we can do is we can cut off this region at some point here. So and just integrate over this bit here, and that will be um, that will be absolutely fine. Um, and the problem is this appears to depend on the cutoff. Well, suppose we cut it off at a different point. So suppose this is y two and that's y one. Then the the integral over the region between y one and y two will be the integral from y equals y one to y two times the integral over x equals minus a half to a half of, um, well, I suppose you've got a term q to the minus n plus something or other. Well, this just becomes zero if n is not zero because q to the minus n is equal to e to the 2 pi i x plus i y um, times n. And you notice the integral from x from minus a half to a half of this is equal to zero. So the integral of q to the n over any um, horizontal slice is just zero. So we can take the limit as y tends to infinity of the integral over the fundamental domain cut off at y of f times g dx dy, that y zero over y squared. And this limit will actually be well defined if f and g are holomorphic modular functions. So here f, g, holomorphic modular functions. Sorry, they're holomorphic on h and um, may have poles at i infinity. Um, for example, if you take the elliptic modular function, you take its inner product with one, um, um, sorry, if, if you take j minus 720 and take the inner product of the 1, this is this is actually equal to 0. And this is why I said earlier that the natural um, constant term for the elliptic modular function is not 744, as is done for historical reasons, but really 24, because, because that makes the function q to the minus 1 plus 24 plus 196884q and so on. Um, turns out to be orthogonal to one under this funny inner product. Anyway, we're not going to talk about, um, the, we're not going to discuss the inner product for modular functions, really. We really want to do it for modular forms. And here we have the problem that if f and g are modular forms of weight k, then f times g or f times g bar are not invariant under SL2 of Z. And this means that the integral over a fundamental domain of f times g bar dx dy over y squared is not defined. It depends on the choice of fundamental domain. I mean, you could define it by fixing a fundamental domain, but that would be, that would be kind of stupid. Um, so what do we do about this? Well, what we notice is that f of tau times d tau to the k over 2 is invariant. And so is g tau bar times d tau bar to the k over 2. Well, how does that help? Because d tau times d tau bar is not invariant. However, um, what you do is you notice that d of minus 1 over tau is equal to d tau over tau squared 
and d of minus 1 over tau bar is equal to d tau bar over tau bar squared and d of the imagine um, and um, the imaginary part of minus 1 over tau is equal to the imaginary part of tau divided by tau times tau bar. Now if you look at this um, you notice that d tau times d tau bar divided by the imaginary part of tau all squared is invariant under SL2 of R. Um, so um, th th this means that if f and g have weight k, so that f of tau times d tau to the k over 2 and g of tau times d tau bar to the k over 2 are both invariant, um, um, we find that f of tau times g bar of tau times the imaginary part of tau to the k is invariant because the um, the, 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 the transformation of the imaginary part of tau cancels out with the transformations of the d tau and the d tau bar. So we can now define a, a, a nice inner product. We just put, we define the inner product of f and g to be the integral over a fundamental domain of f of tau times g of tau bar times um, the imaginary part of tau to the k times dx dy over the imaginary part of tau squared. So um, this bit here is invariant and this bit here is also invariant. So it makes sense to integrate this over a fundamental domain. Um, so um, this means that the Hecker operators Tn you can then check that the Hecker operators Tn are Hermitian. This means that Tn of f g is equal to f times Tn of g. Um, and this implies the cusp forms have a basis of eigenvectors of the operators Tn. Um, so what this implies is that um, anything you can do for the um, discriminant function delta has an analogue for all these eigenforms. For, for example, delta is equal to sum of tau n times q to the n, and we saw that sum of tau n over n to the s can be written as an Euler product, product over p of 1 over 1 minus tau n times p to the minus s plus um, p to the 11 minus 2s. Um, and um, if you've got any other modular form of weight k, so it's sum of cn q to the n, then the, um, the, the corresponding Dirichlet series has a corresponding Euler product this is 1 over 1 minus c n p to the minus s plus p to the and the 11 here obviously gets replaced by k minus 1 minus 2 s. Um, and um, for tau n we have the Ramanujan conjecture which says that tau n has absolute value less than or equal to 2 times sorry tau p has absolute value less than 2 2 times p to the 11 over 2. This was proved by Deligne and Peterson generalized this to say that c of p is going to be less than or equal to 2 times p to the k minus 1 over 2 and that was also proved by Deligne. Um, if you want to try an exercise, um, so exercise, find the eigenforms of weight 24, which is the first case when the space of cusp forms has weight dimension greater than 2. 
greater than 1, sorry. I should warn you that the answer to this is actually a bit messy. In particular, the eigenforms don't even have integer coefficients. They have coefficients that are defined over an imaginary quadratic field. And in general, eigenforms of higher weight all tend to have rather complicated algebraic coefficients rather than integer coefficients.